just waiting for what whiskey to join us. And we are going to have a chat. There he is. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Can't Excellent. Are you ready to be quizzed? I, um, not sure what style I'm going to do. <laughs> Interrogation? No. <laughs> All good. All Did good. you make it into the office or? The office was quite strange. Um, being sat in the office for a change. Yeah. But I thought it was better that than having a two week old screaming in the background. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I chose the time at seven o'clock, which is probably ridiculous because my children go to bed at seven o'clock. So I've left Angus to deal with the family. There I mean, is all. There are, there's a chance there might be some squealing um, I'm next to the bedrooms, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll try it. We'll try it. Um, just looking at, there's a few people joining us. Hi, Andy. Nice to see you. And uh, hey, hey, yeah, Stuart. It's nice to see you too. And you've got a whiskey at hand. Great. I decided to go for another type of barley today. What are you drinking just now? Uh, I've currently got a cask sample of uh, Glen Elgin, I think Ooh. 2006. Oh, nice. So it's a cask sample, therefore it's not available for anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I hummed and head on it. I, I really like it. Um, mm -hmm. And then I went to go and buy the cask and someone else had bought it. So I may, I, well, um, may as well just drink the sample now. Well, I suppose that is the game now. It's what what happens um, with casks. They get they get sold quite quickly. But look, I'm going to start a little bit more formal because I um, I'm trying to get the hang of this now, and I, I, I'm actually able now to upload the videos onto YouTube. So that took me a couple of uh, weeks to figure out how to do that. So not only can you follow this interview live right now, ask questions if you like, you can also watch the video after. Hey, Mike from Luxembourg. Have you met Mike, uh, Mark? I sure have, yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a big Kilcarran fan, so I've got Mike Kilcarran behind me. <laughs> I've got some somewhere, just not here. Yeah, uh, lovely to see you all there. It's nice to see some familiar names popping up, but I'll, I'll focus on Mark, and if you have any questions, just pop them up there, and I shall ask them. I have had a couple in. Uh, there's been a few threats about questions coming up as well from um, uh, joint friends of ours. So we'll see what happens. But he has to go next week, so. Uh... <laughs> that is so true. He knows what he's, he needs to be nice. He needs to play it nice. So thank you so much for spending, uh, what are we, Monday at night with me. Well, it's only for half an hour, an hour. We'll see how long we need. And it's a, bu a bank holiday as well, so it's double time. It's, it's, isn't it funny? Angus said this morning, oh, it's bank holiday. And I straight away went, well, no homeschooling. <laughs> That's what I did. We had the day off. I know. It's just another one. Another one. Another day off. Uh, but massive congratulations to you and Kate, because you've just had a baby girl. She's not, is she even two weeks yet? Well, today. Two weeks today. Oh, and is mum and baby doing well? Both doing really well and touch wood, just sleeping most of the night and so um so uh no it's all going well. Oh uh, it's been quite strange obviously with the current situation, can't have visitors or anything, but in a way it's been quite nice because you know, we've just been the four of us as a family. Uh, yeah. to just figure out what we're doing. You know, I think embrace that um the lockdown because you just want those first few weeks to be with, on your own. Oh, congratulations, says Shilton there. That's lovely. You just want those first couple of weeks to bond with the baby. And it's uh, yeah. also, yeah, as a family, like it's a nice, nice thing to do. I, I kind of, I said that as well. I said two weeks and then we can have guests. I think especially with the, the second one, so, so that Zach doesn't feel left out, potentially. Well. He's got a new job now. He's a big role, so that means he needs to get himself into his role, you know. Oh, he's fair. He's he's fair track it with himself. He, he's very happy with himself being a big brother. So. And what what's the girl's name? I know you've told me, but I can't. Joe. Oh, Joe. Oh, lovely. Zach and Joe. Oh, that's gorgeous. They, they, Love they, it. All short names that can't be short. Keep it short. Keep it short. Um, I'm so pleased, and uh, I was. 
t- so chuffed when you sent me that email a few months ago saying that that was what ha- what's happening and oh, I'm so pleased for you and, and Kate send my love to Kate as well I was going to ask Kate to join us but I didn't I actually then put my mum head on and thought you know what I don't want to put that pressure on her just to like feel like she has to come up with an excuse or what have you we're doing we're doing one with um, Claudio and the Italians in a couple of weeks' time, and I thought that okay, but we'll do that from home, so that'll be probably screaming kids in the background. So. Yeah, well, that that's fine. You'll do that jointly then at, at home, so, so that 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 will work be fine. Uh, but if Kate's watching, I don't know if she is yet, but she'll be watching later, maybe. Hi, and congratulations! I'm still chuffed for you. I'll be watching to make sure I don't say anything wrong. So. <laughs> well, how could that possibly be? I don't think so. I, um, I am not um, a professional interviewer. I'm not a journalist. <laughs> I'm your, we're whiskey buddies, really. So yep. it's just about us having a wee chat. I also know that you and Kate have set up what whiskey. I have questions about that. And then I'm a whiskey geek. I, I know you, uh, I know you quite well, but other people maybe don't know so much. And uh, so I want to ask you about your life in whiskey a little bit. And, um, there are a few things. <laughs> so the, the first thing I, that I was like, oh, what, what am I going to ask Mark? I have so many things. But do you remember the first time we met? We were in Belgium at Spirits in the Sky in Leuven, the sports centre. Right. And so we both then knew Louisa, we still do, Louisa Young, who works for Aaron. And she, so I think that was... Um, at the end, we had done a tour of Belgium, the way you do, you, you visit all the shops. And then it was Spirits of Sky. So I was then meeting the famous Mark Watt for the first time. And uh, it's at the sports center. So the show is upstairs and downstairs they have a bar and they've got these big windows where you can look into the facilities. And where we were sitting was a swimming pool <laughs> with all these grown men and women and families in their uh, swimming wear inside and we were drinking beer watching them basically <laughs> Hello. i know i just thought that was quite uh, uh and that's nice and then i'm that's where we bonded over a beer uh watching um european swimming um and in Belgium. <laughs> yes budgie smugglers basically i didn't know i don't know i mean i've uh, I haven't had enough beer, basically, up. but yes, we did see a bit, bit of that as well. So that it was fun. Anyway, um, that was just a tiny wee anecdote. That was the first time we actually met. Um, I have one more thing, and then I will get you to talk. I talk so much. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you um, I have to thank for my job at Springbank, because I started working at Springbank. And the job I got at Springbank used to be Kate's. But Kate had to move to Speyside because she fell in love with somebody up in Speyside. And that was you. It's funny how it all works out, isn't it? Isn't it? I just thought of that today. I mean, obviously, that's something I, I always knew I was taking Kate's job because she moved up to be with you. But here we are. Like, it, it, that's how it works. It's so lovely. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> Kate the job. Pardon? Stuff didn't turn good thank you and Mitchell who gave Kate the job and it, it just spirals on. Oh, well, let's thank Ewan for giving Kate that job right now. <laughs> he is good. He comes in handy. <laughs> so, um, that, just wanted to say that thank you for that. Um, no, and thank you to everybody that's now joining us. So a few more people signing in and waving. And like I said, I'm not a pro at this. I, I see... Ah, oh, yes, it is a little, great little serendipity. That's your right. And um, I do see some messages. I shall try and um, keep an eye on that as I go along. Um, so we've already mentioned it, but you and Kate did Lockdown Extreme. You had a baby two weeks ago, and uh, <laughs> that must have changed. Even though you had a child before, that must have changed the way you were doing lockdown quite severely. What, what were you doing before baby? What, what was your lockdown routine? No, it's not changed that much. Um, yeah. It's just been, we've been quite lucky up until this last three, four days where it's been raining. It's yeah. been weather, so we've basically just sat in the garden for um, for the whole of it, um, just playing, getting oh. fun about. Um, it's, you know, it's been frustrating, obviously, but um, it's not really changed that much apart from the weather the last four days has been a bit horrible. Yeah, that's true. So you have a you have a house in Campbelltown where you've got a garden. So that's basically been your uh, saviour. You've been out in the garden all time. 
Yeah, Bowie Garden got we food shed, well, pizza shed. So it's uh, nice. It's been pretty good. Oh, uh, that sounds great. Just on Glebe Street, just right next. Oh to yeah. It. Oh, I know where you are. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so I take it, um, but Kate didn't need to go to Glasgow or anything. She was just in Campbelltown. So we, we chucked Zach to our mum and dad's and then we went up to Paisley. Oh. Uh, that was a wee bit strange. Kate we also was in on the Monday for, for the baby being born. And then uh, I got kicked out and then Kate was in for a couple of days. And then I went and got to pick her up from the door. So it was quite strange having had the baby, being in Glasgow. I was staying with Kate's uncle, um, and then being in Glasgow, being kicked out, knowing I can't go and see Kate or that for two two days. I mean, uh, if anything, it was almost the perfect father thing. You know, you've had the baby, you can't do anything, go away. You can't come in for two days, go and get drunk, but there was no open to celebrate. So, you know, it was... <laughs> I know, where are you going to have that cigar and dram? Was that in somebody's living room then? I uh, just, I, I, I had a couple of drams. It was fairly, fairly tame. Oh, well, it all went smooth and you're all home now anyway and you've got plenty of drums in your house and your office, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, that was one of the biggest problems with lockdown was um, we just moved into the office fairly recently and most of because we were having uh, Joe having another child, we realised quite late that we should probably get round to planning for, for our coming. Uh, yeah. And so we changed the booze room in the in the house into a bedroom and then moved Zach's bedroom round and then, and then so we moved all the, most of the booze to the office. And yeah. Then, oh, it was one day I went to go and have a dram and I was like, I've got no whiskey in the house. Oh, oh but, a rookie mistake. I, I, I had some in the garden, so it was okay. But um, it was... Uh, yes, you do. It was uh, quite strange. So it's quite nice to sneak back in here every now and again and just pick up a few bottles. And where is your office then? It's in Kirk Street. Okay. Way to the Arch Hill, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, the the premises, uh, Kate's dad, Keith, uh, had an accountancy firm here. Okay. Uh, and he sold up and retired a couple of years ago. So he's just renting out the bottom floor. Mm -hmm. We've got the top floor for now. Oh, cool. Um, so it looks like we've got quite a grand office. You know, we've got quite a big tasting room here. We've got two or three other offices. Um, but I mean, we don't need it. But from the outside, once we get our branding done, it'll look it'll look the part. Uh, it. I think that will you'll you'll get that'll come handy, Mark. It, especially with what you're planning. Maybe I don't know what you're planning. We'll talk more about that. But if if you're doing tastings, you can have it set up a bit more yeah. for. Yeah. Well, we, we we do plan tastings. Say we've got a wee tasting room up here which looks looks part it's all odds and sods of furniture I'll maybe try and show you later um, but we have a bit of a problem because we can't get it licensed no ah uh, because yeah. okay we have a disabled toilet upstairs um, mm -hmm. but we don't need disabled access we just need a disabled toilet upstairs I mean uh, that makes perfect sense uh, but that that <laughs> We'll, we'll figure that out. So at the minute we can do taste, I shouldn't be saying this, but we can <laughs> do, do tastings for free, um, but we can't charge people. Um, I mean, we don't want to be doing like regular mm -hmm. things or whatever, but just if people are down in town, we can do stuff at, or in the yeah. evening. And you've got the Archil and you've got all these places that probably happily let you have a, yes, a room. Yeah. Oh, great, part. great spot. Great spot for it. We can do tastings in there as well if we need mm -hmm. we, we managed to get one done before uh, lockdown and then and then we had to stop so oh really well this is it i mean we are right now in are we in the middle no yesterday would have been the last day of campbellton festival this year am i right uh friday friday would have been the last day oh friday and then people are over to isla of course because it's in isla now sorry i'm a couple of days behind uh compared Jen. Wednesday, Scotia, Thursday, Springburn, Friday, Kilkerran, and uh, Cadden Heads. And then next year, Saturday, we're going to have our own open day. Yeah, I saw that. I want to ask you about this. Have you got, a, I know you, you're, let, you're letting people know now, so they know when they're booking to stay on. Because um, Isla gets very busy. You want to stay in Campbelltown. <laughs> who, who wants to go to Lagavulin there, obviously? 
Do you know what? Actually, for those of you watching, I'm sure you all know already, Or, but I always found visiting Isla two weeks or three weeks or a month before the festival is the best time because they're all really chilled out. They're, they're painting, they're decorating. They usually have organized the whiskey they're going to be selling. And if you're lucky, you might get a try. But if you're not, if not, then you, you, you just have to maybe put an order in or whatever you or send a friend to buy it. But I must say, I really enjoy going to Isla before the festival just to avoid the crowds. That could be my age. It, 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 is, it is good, it is good. Um, but we're, we're just doing, doing a wee thing, the working, well, the theory is it's what Whiskey and Friends, um, so we're, we have been speaking to a few of our industry colleagues, um, see if they'll maybe take a wee stand or something as well, because obviously we're not really going to have enough booze for a whole day's festival just on our own, <laughs> and probably not, um, so we'll maybe pull in some, some of our industry colleagues and get them down. Uh, and just to steal a malt stock term, just have a kind of relaxed day, sitting, having a few drams and taking it easy, you know, not hustle and bustle, a few tastings. Um, yeah. but more more just to kind of finish off relaxing. Uh, yeah. yeah Take stock. Take stock of what's been and, and have a, another t a nice relaxed tasting or two and um, see what's on. We've got a courtyard out the back here, so hopefully if it's sunny, uh, we can, you know, all be out there and just get a few tables and chairs and sit in the sunshine and have a few beers, have a few whiskeys um, and chew the fat. That sounds great. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I I, um, I was meant to be at Campbelltown this week with a group of Swedish uh, um, golfers, whiskey drinkers, and uh, got obviously cancelled. So we are hoping for next year. I mean, you never know. These pandemics <laughs> come around once a hundred a year or whatever. <laughs> Um, but so it'd be great to be part of that. We'll um, keep an eye out for your uh, for your what whiskey and friends day on the Saturday. WF so <laughs> not <laughs> wrestling or the pandas. I know that would be quite good. Uh, no, I mean wrestling wouldn't be that good. Maybe you should have whiskey wrestling. That could be one of the uh, activities. Hey, <laughs> you mud wrestling. Don't give me. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of a few volunteers. So what uh, time it is now? Uh, you are not born in Campbelltown. You are born because you're you're uh, you've moved there. Yes. Obviously to be with Kate. She's from Campbelltown, born and bred. But you come from somewhere else. Where are you from? I'm Speyside. So I'm uh, the other whiskey capital. Yeah. So where well, were you born? It's uh, well, I, there's there's a myth that I, I was born at McAllen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you knew I was getting at that. <laughs> I, I wasn't born in McAllen. I moved to McAllen. I was born to Craigellachie, which was a mile away. Yeah. Uh, well, is a mile away. Funny enough, it hasn't moved. <laughs> it uh, and uh, moved to McAllen when I was 18, 16 months old. Okay. So pretty much did grow up at McAllen at the at the distillery. Um, so yeah. And was that to do with anybody working there from your family? My, my dad. Uh, ran the farm at McAllen. Okay. Uh, subsequently worked at the distillery and my mum worked, uh, had various jobs with the distilleries as well. So, uh, and then I got some part-time work there as well. So it was, uh, yeah. I know. I mean, I, I suppose you were starting working there as soon as you legally could. Was it 16 or 18? At 16, 16, I had my first summer job there, which was brilliant. Well, I say it was brilliant. It was terrible. We, the job we had was, um, they brought in the barcoding system. This is how old I am. They brought in <laughs> um, and the... Um, oh, the casks. Casks. And so we Ooh. full room with a couple of hundred thousand barcodes and they would mm. give a list of each warehouse and the stows and which casks were in them and you had to go and find the barcodes and put them in order and then someone else would staple them to the casks. Um, so you would go to bed at night just seeing barcodes. It was <laughs> crazy, but... For a 16-year-old, it was ridiculous money. Um, we were, you know, I can't remember what money we were on, but ridiculous money. And uh, I remember the guys saying, you're going too fast. You'll be finished this job too quickly. Oh, so slow down, like, don't, <laughs> don't work too fast. Just at times, make sure you look busy if anyone comes in. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> But it's, it's, uh, I, I mean, I can see you're working fast. Yeah, you're very efficient. <laughs> That's, 
that's really fun. So there'll still be casks lying up at McAllen that you've uh, barcoded. But, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm unlikely ever to see any of them again. But it's... <laughs> <laughs> Can you not go in there <laughs> and say, look, this is what I'm doing right now. Could you uh, give us a cask? Yeah, that would be good. So that, that's kind of, well, I was going to say if you had any other jobs out with whiskey, but if that was your first job, hey, Whiskey Lounge, is that Eddie or Amanda? I don't know, one of them, <laughs> both of them, hello. <laughs> every, every job I've ever had has been whiskey related, apart from up until I was 16, I used to go and uh, pick tatties. Sorry. <laughs> in the tatty holidays and like pick strawberries and things uh, during the summer holidays. So uh, other than that, from since 16, every job's been booze really. So really, since you were 16, since you worked at McAllen, your jobs have been at, um, in the whiskey industry. Bear with me, Mark. My four-year-old is screaming his head off and I'm sure it's being picked up on the camera. I'm just going to try and pull the door. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm right here. Um, so after McAllen, or after your job doing the um, if, barcoding, what was uh, what was next on the agenda? I mean, you still went to school. I know you went to university. Yeah, allegedly. Um, <laughs> first, first real proper whiskey job, though, was um, when I turned 18 and it became legal to drink. Um, I started working behind the bar at the Craigelico Hotel, the famous Quake Bar, and that's what really got me into whiskey. Um, at the time, there was probably 800 single malts. Um, or eight, there was probably about 800 single malts behind the bar. And I got into it by chance, kind of. Well, a lot of chance. Uh, so you, uh, so you, you're obviously at this point living still at McAllen, where your family were at the farm. Okay, so you're only a mile down the road, like I said, working at the uh, Kregaliki bar. Yeah. I, I'm on the beer, Eddie, sorry. Just, I'm on the... Edinburgh Belfield beer and and Mark is drinking some luxury. It's a Glen Elgin, two thousand. Glen Elgin, <laughs> a cask sample. Um, what are you drinking, Eddie? Tell us what you're drinking. Or, or, or yes, please tell us. <laughs> so uh, sorry, Mark. So you you're living in Rockallan at the farm, and then you're working in the Craig Alligator Bar. Well, and basically, I kind of went for a job. At when I was turning 18, I knew I was going to be going to the local college and I wrote CVs to everyone in the world uh, looking for a job. Well, not in the world, but everyone, um, everyone locally. That was yeah. my, I'll jump ahead to another story of when I'd left university. Before I left university, I wrote to every whiskey company in the world with my CV looking for a job. Um, and then, so wrote every and bizarrely when I was working at Cadden Heads I moved office and I was looking through a filing cabinet and there was my letter um, <laughs> job in the office that I ended up having as my office uh, I looked at it and I said well I wouldn't have given me a job either but uh, so, so yeah oh Mark you have to frame that do you keep that no it's still in the office so. oh frame it you should frame it that's a great little memory to have um, but yeah so we started working went for an interview at the Craig Hotel and I thought they were going to give me a job as a pot wash, you know, just like clean. Yeah. But bizarrely on the same day, I got offered a, a job in the warehouse at McAllen for the summer as well. So I got offered two jobs in the same day. Uh, Sorry, Mark, I'm just going to interrupt you. That's actually Eddie again and Amanda. They're saying they're finding it hard to hear you. Are you able to, either if you have headphones or if you can... Thanks, Eddie and Amanda. I appreciate that. I, I no, obviously. Well, do you know what it probably is? It's probably because I was balancing it on, um, on the table. Oh, okay. That might is that better now, uh, Eddie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so all good, all good. You don't want me too close, but never mind. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought I was getting a job as a pot wash, and. Um, Got offered the two jobs in the same day. I went back to the Craig Hotel and said, like, look, I've been offered this other job. It was just for six weeks, but um, the Craig Hotel job was going to see me through uh, college. Um, yeah. And so they ended up giving me both jobs. Um, and so I, I worked during the day, nine till five at, uh, or nine till four at McAllen, and then started behind the bar at six o'clock at night until the last person went to, to bed. 
Um, so that was, so that was good. Um, and you can do that kind of thing when you're 18. Like you've got oh, yeah. that stamina. And uh, but you know how many grown men and women are so jealous of you right now, working at McAllen during the day and the Craigalki at night time. That is yeah. some. It's probably some so, probably sounds, sounds better than it was, but it was it was good fun. The um, it was long hours, but when you know it's oh. only for six eight weeks, yeah, it's it's fine. Um, Did you work with then, anybody that we like uh, famous whiskey world famous that you got to know back then that you still see and know, or was that later on you would start? I meeting? mean, obviously there was the McAllen lot. You know, you had David Robertson's, you had uh, uh, oh, Russell Anderson, uh -huh. um, uh, all all sorts of people. I forget their names now. Um, well, so so like a, a young new newbie to whiskey, I say newbie because you were legal to drink at 18. Yeah. I have this vague feeling that you might have tried whiskey before 18, I don't know. To be honest, I was quite a late developer. Oh. Um, I, well, I had tried whiskey, I probably tried whiskey for, for when I was about four, four or five, but like, I, really <laughs> didn't, I really didn't start drinking properly until I was about 16. So um, obviously my children will not do that. Um, <laughs> But uh, so yeah, so there, there was a bit. The, the first time I ever got drunk, actually, um, was I changed um, bedrooms with my big brother. He'd moved to the Falkland Islands, and I took his bedroom and I found a bottle of famous grouse in the room. And me and my weight went and climbed up onto the warehouse roof of one of the McCallum warehouses and drunk a bottle of grouse between us. Um, <laughs> and, and looking back now, it was like, we were sat on top of all this amazing whiskey. I know. And then, <laughs> Sorry, that's and, really good. And the classic thing you do when you're young, drinking from the bottle. <sighs> drinking. Do you think we can add water yet? No, but having to make sure you drunk loads until you added water, you know, it's... Uh... That's... Oh, so your first proper sort of drunkenness was on top of the McAllen warehouses drinking famous grouse. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, but, uh, 1996. It was the night before um, Scotland played football at Euro Euro 96. Oh, <laughs> that was a good summer then. <laughs> yeah. Good summer. Oh, great. So where where did you go to university or you say college? I, well, I went to college. I went to the local Murray College, um, mm -hmm. which was, to be honest, really simple. It was, we used to call it um, combing your hair and tying your shoelaces because uh, it, was, it was pretty simple, to be honest. Um, I did, a, did an HND in business admin. Great. Uh, and that made that was handy. I, I work at uh, the Craig Hotel for, I worked there for two and a half years. So I was working there full time, you know, starting three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, shortly after starting working there, I was on like lock up. So I would, and because it's hotel bar license, I would finish when the last guest went to bed. Uh, and sometimes there was guests like me that would just stay up. So uh, it was it was pretty pretty hectic. I remember one time I finished work at seven thirty in the morning, and I had an exam that day at nine o'clock. And I went into Elgin, did the exam, and I got woken up because the lecturer uh, I fell asleep during the exam, <laughs> which I passed. But my snoring was uh, annoying the other <laughs> the other. <laughs> You were you were keeping the others away from their exam by snoring. That is yeah. pretty. So. Uh, I was just thinking there. If you've been work, you've worked many late nights at the Craig Allocky, You must have served. So so since then we'll talk about it. But you've travelled the world, being a brand ambassador <laughs> for various companies, a sales manager. You must have come across people like I don't even know, like the types of Ingrid Vonda or any of oh, these. Oh yeah, I mean guys. all those guys. You know, hands they would have said <laughs> you served me in the Craig Allocky. Oh, well, did they? Hans Offringa has got a book called The Road to Craigellachie. Um, oh, yeah. And, and I always wind him up about it because it's a great book, but if you read it, it, it'll say, oh, this person, I sat down with Wallace Melroy and I did this and blah, blah, blah. And the barman poured me this and then blah, blah, blah. And the barman did this. He keeps referring to the barman and I'm the barman, but he never <laughs> mentions me by name. It's like, come on. <laughs> a claim to fame. Yeah. So, I mean, we've got, you got to know a lot of the industry there because most of the industry used it. Yes, absolutely. That's would the maybe thing. Have, um, you know, McAllen in one corner, Glen Fartless in another, Glen Ferrick in another. Um, yeah. You'd have Michael Jackson staying, you'd have Charlie McLean, you'd have Jim Murray, whatever. Um, and all these uh, 
this fruit is an importers that we now know. They also always yeah. spent time in these. And the writers, like I said. So it's, it, was, it was the place to be. So it was a good place to learn. Um, learn a lot by just listening in while I was washing glasses, you know, um, um, drying glasses and things like that. So it was, it was, it was interesting. It was, it was a really good grounding. Uh, there was a guy, I was known as Wee Mark there because my boss was Big Mark. Okay. Uh, he was smaller than me, but he was the boss. So it, it was either that or call him Old Mark and me Young Mark, <laughs> um, which he wasn't going for. No. Um, so I just got known as Wee Mark, which was quite funny. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we, they, I learned a lot from them, but you had to know who was in because different well, companies. So let's say it was Inverhouse, you had to know what brands they represented or Diageo, which brands were theirs or... You know, I know because you did. You did, wouldn't want to pour the wrong whiskey, or like yeah. they would just assume that you knew. And oh, it, it, can, so it, can end, it can end you in trouble. Um, yeah. There was there was one time John Grant from Glenfartless, uh, great great whiskey. George's dad. Yeah, George's dad uh, was in with a couple of clients, um, and that was fine. They were sat in the corner of the bar, and uh, I was probably eighteen and a half, nineteen at the time. These two Americans came in just coincidence of Americans, but uh, we were there and they came in and was like, oh, I'm looking for a whiskey. It's like, are you in the right place? There's 800 <laughs> here. Um, did the usual, you know, what sort of thing are you looking for? Um, you know, and they were like, oh, we'd like Speyside, Sherry Cask Speyside. I was like, brilliant. Uh, and it's like, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, this one would be good, that one would be good. And obviously Glen Farkless would be an excellent choice. And uh, John Grant, Kind of give me a nod and a wink as I say, Well done, Mark, you've you know done well. And the guy goes, No, nah, we don't like Glenn Fart, it's, it's crap. <laughs> oh no, so obviously, I didn't know. <laughs> but in, in fairness to John, he then came across and he bought them, I think, the 10, 12, 15, 17, 21, 25, 30, <laughs> and, them wrong. and the 40 year old. And by the end of it, they loved Glenn Fartless. So, I think the moral of the story is to say you don't like Glenn Fartless in front of John and you might get some free drums, but <laughs> I am only joking. Please don't do that. Um, it's, don't uh, try this at home. Yeah. So, but it was good. It was, it was a very good grounding. Um, and funny. lots of people looked after, you know, you would have people like Ed Dodson, formerly distillery manager of um, Glenn Murray coming in. And, you know, people would, would look after you and it was yeah. a very good grounding. I bet you have some... Um... Like some dirt on some of them. <laughs> the, 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 prob the, the problem is they've now got equally as much on me. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that currency doesn't work anymore. No. Oh, no, that's bad. So how long did you end up? So that was just the summer uh, no, no, kind of... No, I was, I was there for two and a half years. I went through oh, yeah. a period of basically staying in jobs for two and a half years. <laughs> um, so I was there for two and a half years, finished my, my uni course and then met my college course. And then I moved to Edinburgh to go to Napier to do a marketing degree, which will make everybody laugh. Um, I do actually have a degree in marketing, which... Looking <laughs> yeah, at... I believe you. That's yeah. good. <laughs> Napier, yeah. um, I mean, Napier is a great university. I, I, I have friends that studied there when I was at Harry Walsh. And um, Napier had quite a good whiskey society, in my, if I remember rightly. Uh, Napier didn't have one when I was there. Edinburgh had a... Edinburgh Uni had a, a very good one. They actually yeah. wanted me to be their chairman at one point, and then I had to Whoa. tell them that I didn't actually go to their university. <laughs> I, I keep showing the certificate. Okay, so I Eddie doesn't know, believe you. Uh, Wolf is the Water of Leaf. Uh, Water of Leaf. <laughs> yeah. Water of Life Society, that's Edinburgh Whiskey yeah. uh, Club, uh, Edinburgh University Whiskey Club. And it's a great club. So many people in the industry have, have been or come from that club. I, I, I didn't go to Edinburgh Uni either, but I think I've been there. I, don't, I go to their tastings whenever I can, and I've done tastings there too. It's a great club. Yeah. No, it is. It's, 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 it's good, and it's a good grounding. As you say, lots of people end up in the industry through it. Um, so it's... see, back in those days when you were at... Because um, I moved to Edinburgh in 97, and you would have been to university in Edinburgh around about the same time. You probably no, were. No, I, I, I was probably... It was 2001, because I I'd spent the millennium at the Craig Hotel. Okay. And then uh, it was 2001, I went down to Edinburgh. So even so, those times, because I'm just, Edinburgh as a, as a whiskey town, where there was no whiskey bars. I always found that quite bizarre. The only place 
in my mind, well, you have the bow bar, which has been around, and then it, but, but? The great bar, bow bar. Yeah, oh, great, great place. But that's the only one I can remember from those, like, early 2002, maybe. But there were no, like, you'd go to a hotel bar or some or, or a bar in Edinburgh, and there was no whiskey I... co- uh, um, knowledge or whiskey enthusiasm. Whereas now, you can't throw a... I don't know, I'm still good at hitting my whiskey plates. So. I, I, I do agree with you. I remember um, being in Edinburgh, and well, when I first went down, I started working uh, at Scottish Malt Whiskey Society, so I did work in the yes. whiskey bar. Um, but I remember going into other bars and like thinking, oh, this will be a whiskey bar. And I had more, as a student, I had more whiskey in my flat than, yeah. than they did. And you're like, yeah. this is wrong. I always thought that it was strange. Edinburgh is the cap- well, capital of Scotland, but so little whiskey in it, heritage in it. Well, it didn't have little whiskey heritage. It just had little whiskey bars. There was no bars or class. Certainly changed now. I mean, oh, yeah. there, used to, there used to be the uh, one that Misako opened. Did you ever go into that Ems bar in the grass market? Yeah. That was, that was a fantastic bar. Oh. I did feel sorry that when it closed because I probably was one of their best customers. Uh, so much so that... Um, I'd, I'd drunk everything that I could afford because um, there were some quite expensive drams in there. And then Mizako gave me um staff discount so I could afford 20% more um, of of everything. And then, so when it closed, there was like, oh God, out of the 400 bottles, there were like so many of them that I opened and had one dram out of and then moved on to the next one. So, yeah. yeah. Just opened them, yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. It was a great bar. They, I don't they, know. They actually they offered me a job there once, but I thought, well, I'm generally your best customer, so if I become... <laughs> yes, that's not a good business move. <laughs> no. Did you work in Edinburgh, though, while you were a student? Did you have yeah, a... Well, I, 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 I fitted in, um, I fitted in uni roundabout work. So I, I was working um, behind the bar with the Scottish Malt Whiskey Society. Oh, down at Leith? Or... Down at Leith, uh, yeah, the proper bar. Um, well, oh, hang first... on. Where you worked with Annabelle, isn't it? Yes, that's where we're... at one point, at one point, the bar staff of the society was myself, Annabelle, and Arthur Motley. Oh, Arthur as well. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was a pretty pretty good team. Oh my goodness, I had completely forgotten that his. Had... This is kind of like I'm waiting for the red book. It's like this is your life here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I am loving it. Yes, yeah. Let's go for that. Let's do it. Let's go. So, so you were there as a student, and then did you? So after graduating, and oh no, there's the, more, there's more to it than that. <laughs> I, I then uh, also worked at Royal Mile Whiskies, um, so I started working in the shop at Royal Mile Whiskies. Ah. Um, I came home drunk one night, and um, there was an email came in, you know, on the old dial-up internet, <laughs> um, that Royal Mile Whiskies were looking for staff. So I put in my CV, and a, about a week, ten days later, I. I phoned him up and was like, um, I put in my CV, I've not heard anything back, you know, what's going on? And they're like, well, we liked your CV, but your phone number you put in is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> so, so I, I, then, I, then got a job, I, I then got a job working, working for them uh, and at times working at the society at the same time. Uh-huh. And part of my third year I think it was at uni was a 12 week work placement which I did at one of my whiskey so I worked in their office running their website and stuff well helping on their website running their website is making it sound like I was more important than I was um and then so I stayed there for two and a half years and until Keir Sword was like you should probably go back and finish your degree because if you don't go now you'll probably never go so you know I, I didn't really want to but I'm indebted to gear for uh, letting me, well, getting rid of me, uh, and <laughs> me go back there. And so that's when, back when I went back to uni, I also went kind of back to working behind the bar at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and that's when Georgie Crawford was my boss. Ah! How long did you end up spending in Edinburgh then, if you had a little break uh, in so It was about five years in total. Yeah, five okay. Years to do two years of a degree. And well done for finding those whiskey places. Like I said, it was not many of them in Edinburgh back then. No. Oh, uh, God, that's so good. I'd completely missed that you worked at Royal Mile Whiskies at one point. It was, uh, 
No, it was it was, it was good good time. I, I really enjoyed my Roma whiskey's days um, and and the bar staff way because like you get proper feedback, and that's yeah. why like these days I, I still love being uh, at whiskey shows and, and hosting tastings because you get immediate feedback. Face to face, yeah. You know, when I was behind the bar in the Craig Hotel, you know, you quite often you get people who weren't necessarily whiskey fans, so mm. I would convert a lot of people because they'd come in, see all this whiskey, and you go right from. They're staying for a week. By the end of the week, they're whiskey converts. You've got them. Yeah. You take them through, try this, try that, try that. Okay, which one do you like best? And guide them from there. Yeah. You know, so you get instant feedback. Then you work in a shop and your person has to take it away and then you get feedback. And like, I always felt like the more I got up the ladder in whiskey, the further away you got from the customer. So it used to be in the bar, used to be in the shop, used to then be the person who sold to the shop, then yeah. the person who sold to the person who sold to the person who sold, you know. And so you get further and further away from the, the consumer. And, you know, in a way, that's why social media is really important because you still, as much as it can annoy you at times when people mm -hmm. say bad things about you, um, you know, you, you, get, you get that feedback that you miss by not being face-to-face -face pouring a dram. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I do remember in the early days when I was at Springbank in 2010, when people were starting to more and more use Facebook for their whiskey uh, meetups or whiskey drinking and commenting. And uh, it could be quite hurtful when they were talking about products that you felt for or you've been working really hard with. And, but uh, you're right. At least you had that feedback. You know, they yeah. weren't talking behind your back. I, I, don't, I don't know if I'll be so forgiving when it's our products and someone slates it. <laughs> Well, you don't need to be. You're the boss. You can just tell them where to go. Well, if it doesn't yeah. sit you, <laughs> you know where to go. <laughs> I, I, do still, I do still have to uh, answer to Kate and pay my mortgage. So. <laughs> uh, well, uh, there is that, yeah. Well, Kate, Kate is, um, I mean, between the two of you, yeah, I, mean, but, well, I don't know how many years, decades and between, decades of whiskey between world. Between the two of us, um, just over 40 years mm. in the industry. Because I'm 22 years in the industry mm. and she's about 18. Yeah, you, you you do have this. And I mean, she's uh, she's been working at Glen Farclass, Springbank. Yes. I know she's great. She so is. I'm just think adding things up here now. So you're about 23 now in Edinburgh, and you've already yep. met people that are legends and worked with all these people, and and well, then speak, we're speak, <laughs> speak, speaking of legends. The first ever whiskey tasting thing I did uh -huh. was at the first ever Spirit of Speyside Whiskey Festival. Um, that was to Eddie, sorry, in case you thought I was just throwing you some secret love part. Right. <laughs> For you too, Mark. <laughs> the it's first okay. ever Spirit Space Whiskey Festival, and again, I was working at the Craig Hotel. Yeah. And uh, they were doing a, an evening with friends, and it was uh, about 50 people, and Ed Dodson, as I said earlier, distillery manager of Glen Murray did a tasting, so he did Glen Mornsey, Glen Murray and Ardbeg, because they were all owned by the same people at that time. And then Robin Lane did his songs about, I love Glen Mornsey, it's so orangey and all that, you know, and uh, so that was fine. Then we had dinner, and then there was a question and answer session with okay. me and Michael Jackson. <laughs> I just said, uh, and I always remember at times... Oh, like, you met Michael Jackson. I'm so jealous. You know, I was... I met him a few times. He's a great guy. Um, but uh, I remember I'd, full of enthusiasm, you know, 19 years old or whatever. I was like, oh, and I would answer the questions. And he'd be like, yeah, it's Mark. That's one way of looking at it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so... So did you feel did you feel you couldn't really like do your your answers because he was right there or yeah it was it was it was quite intimidating but there's been a few moments like that has been um, intimidating and I, and I still get it you know like a good few years afterwards the first time I was in a tasting up in Dufton and Ronnie Cox came into my tasting you know Ronnie Red Sox and me like yeah. <laughs> I never happened to be doing a, a Glen Rothis in the tasting that day you know that's like gets you nervous. Uh, Giorgio Ambrosio, one time in Italy, came into my taste, and you're like, oh, you know, and there's there's lots of people like that when you you see guys like Maddie Fiore or you know yeah. Eddie. When Eddie comes into your taste, and you get worried, you know, because you never know what he's going to do. Um, but it's it is it's. I think there's you still get kind of starstruck by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you look up to people, and and yeah. you just respect their work, and you just have that um, awe of them, don't you? 
Yeah. It's funny because so many people have an awe of you and, and, and hearing you say that about other uh, whiskey legends. And, was, uh, I've got so many stories. I know you do. <laughs> and do you know what really is, is annoying? Because I'm terrible for this because I'm loving chatting here, Mark. Uh, I have an hour, but if we need it, we can always we can do another hour. But I just do your game. Yeah. But it depends on if you need to look after Zach or anything. So I'm, I don't want I'm to take. I, I can stay at the house. <laughs> Kate's probably pleased for the break. But <laughs> another another uh, legend story was um, this one year I was I was doing a t tasting tour not that long ago uh, Belgium and then went straight to Limburg. Oh, you know it was really got to got to the uh, hotel quite late at night. Um, obviously it was in Belgium, turned on the TV and um, oh, the Angel Share was playing. Oh. So I'm, li I'm, lying, I'm lying in bed and watching Angel Share that's dubbed into French and Charlie McLean speaking to me in French. It was oh, quite strange. And then the next day I had lunch with Charlie and I was like, last night you were in my room speaking French to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, that sounds like a dream. <laughs> Not one I maybe had, but <laughs> oh, I love it. I, and Shilton mentioned that uh, you know malt stock, which is in Holland. There is this um, great whiskey festival. Apparently, you walked in on his his tasting there. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't quite make it. I'm afraid, Shilton. I, I, oh. <laughs> I was trying to, but um, the train was delayed. Also, oh, he's upset that you didn't make it to his yeah. tasting. I was wondering what that was. <laughs> he's just smiling. Okay. Uh, love it. So, okay. So now you have your certificate. You've got a degree in marketing and yes. loads of whiskey friends. What happened next? Uh, well, before I got my degree, um, when I was working in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, I, um, oh, that's another story. I, <laughs> met, I, I, I met you and Shand. Um, oh. At, he was in the bar with a couple of, a couple of customers, and um, there was a Ben Rennes that um, Ewan was going on about how great Ben Rennes was, and I was like, I, I love Ben Rennes, one of my favourite whiskeys, and this particular whisky wasn't to my style, I'm not saying it wasn't good, it just wasn't to my particular yeah, yeah. And, and I knew it, was, it wasn't a, a typical Ben Rennes, so the way he'd been describing it to the people he was offering it to wasn't how it was going to be. Um, so, so afterwards I went over and he was like, I could tell by your face that, you know, I was making a mistake with this. And I was like, yeah, but I couldn't say anything. And so stuck up, uh, you know, had a couple of drinks with him or whatever. And then that's how I ended up pretty much getting a job at, at Duncan Taylor. So I'd um, pretty much guaranteed the job in the January and then didn't graduate till whenever you graduate. I don't know. Yeah. So it didn't really give me much incentive to, to do no. much in between. Um, you had so, a job to go to. Oh, yeah, really? Duncan Taylor chosen. was your first job from university. Yeah. So the first, the first tasting I did for Duncan Taylor, bizarrely, was in Malaga for a group of 45 Swedes. <laughs> were they there playing golf by any chance? <laughs> they were, actually, yeah. That makes more sense. So, uh, so that was quite bizarre. But was that your first Duncan Taylor tasting? That was my first Duncan Taylor tasting. So That's great. I thought... I so sat on the beach in Malaga before the taste, and I was like, I think I could get to enjoy this. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you and I have, I don't know if we've had many pints in Scottish grounds, but we have had pints and whiskey yeah. and various um, martinis in been Japan, Belgium, yeah. Italy. I mean, it's, we've been all over. You've been all over. I know you have, um, you spent a lot of your professional uh, life in Japan, haven't you? you you've yes. got really strong connections to Japan, and that's... Yeah, uh, I've been going to Japan for quite a while. I've been to Japan 49 times. Um, so I've just, I've won off the big 50. So uh, hopefully that will happen at some oh, point. There must uh, be a what whiskey friend in Japan there looking for a tasting. I can think uh, of a few. Yeah, there's quite a few bars I'll hopefully be visiting again soon. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I got lucky again. Um, you know Tatsuya, Minagawa-san? Of course, yeah. Well, a good while after I'd been... Oh, no, it wasn't that. After I'd left the Craig Hotel, they were looking for a barman. And so Tatsuya went to be the barman in the Craig Elke Hotel. Yeah. Oh. Now, now, Hank Hugh Department Store visited the hotel and thought, right, we have a British fair every year in the department store. We want to replicate your bar in our department store for a week every uh, uh, for, thing. And unfortunately, well, 
that's sinful. I was going to say, unfortunately for Tatsuya's Japanese, but by that I mean they didn't want to pay someone Japanese to fly across to run a Scottish okay. bar in, in Japan. So Duncan Elphick phoned me and he was like, I was, again, I was at uni at the time, he was like, are you busy in October? And I thought, oh, he's going to want me to do a couple of shifts. I was like, oh, you know, I'm at uni these days, I'm quite busy. And he was like, oh, well, actually, I was just wondering if you'd fancy going to Japan. I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, for about eight years, I went to Japan every for a week every year to run a whiskey bar. Um, oh, so that was amazing. that was pretty brilliant. Um, and so, hence, like by the time we were all eight years ago in Japan together, which was a phenomenal trip, probably one of the best. Um, you know, I'd been there quite a lot, so I knew knew quite a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, yes, we were relying on you, both me and Stuart. That night, we were out. We which, went is, to... which is never a good thing to do if you're relying on me. <laughs> oh, you, you are our guiding light in Tokyo. Uh, yeah, uh, it was, so, I mean, that was a great trip. Whiskey Live, uh, Tokyo, and we went to Osaka as well. No, fantastic. Yeah. And you've been, I mean, Japan is, I, that was one of my favourite trips I ever did. For, and me, I, I, for me, it's, it's, it's probably is my favourite country in the world. Um, I love other countries, like I love going to Belgium, love going to Denmark, etc, etc, Sweden, obviously. Um, yeah. But I think Japan is just that, because everyone's so different, everyone's so polite. Um, yeah. and it's clean, different. but not just that. But you know what I really love? It's those little bars that yeah. make, if you look at them and you're uh, into uh, making money, you look at them and you go, well, there's no profit in here. And it's just yeah. like three seats. And there's like hundreds of whiskeys, three seats. And so the, the wall is right here and then the chair. That is the experience of a lifetime. You've got a bartender hacking a perfect sphere in eyes, just like doo -doo 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 -doo, making you a... Uh, a tall uh, whiskey. Bar. Yeah, I, I absolutely love the atmospheres in all these bars we went to, and the bar names are funny. Campbelltown Lock and all those different ones. That it's a, such uh, a what, beautiful. What, one of my favourites is bar names is in Yokohama. It's called Bar Rain, <laughs> and, and I was like, me and Dave Brim were in it, and I was like, oh, why would you call it Bar Rain? And he's like, well, I went to Scotland and I saw sheep and I saw rain, so. It was either going to be bar sheep or bar rain. <laughs> he backed it up. He didn't just pick a name. He had no. done his uh, survey. Yes, he, had, he had surveyed. Oh, no, I love that. Uh, Japan, a great the, country. The, the, the bars, are, the, some of the great, greatest whiskey bars in the world, you know, the Marsh Dunn, um, oh, there's so many. So and many. also, I mean, uh, I mean, like I said, we travel a lot and you, you, you get to know each... Um, almost, uh, I mean, it's a bad thing to do, but every country have their own uh, behavior. And if you do tastings, I always find doing tastings in Switzerland to begin with, they were very calm and collected. And they weren't, even after whiskey, they didn't become that much more um, inquisitive. Tastings were quite uh, well behaved. Um, some countries, they're not, like like Belgium. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different story altogether. But you find that the people of the countries have a different, um, uh, I don't know how to say it, like um, just culture, I suppose, for how yeah. they behave when they're drinking whiskey. Um, but in Japan, they have such knowledge. They just know. Uh, they know their whiskies and they know their facts. And uh, but not in a snore boring. Uh, don't come here with percentages and, and commas. They actually have lovely uh, stories of when they have visited the distilleries yeah. because it's not, the, that the, passion takes them there. The first time I went to Japan, I've got so many Japan. So, but the first time I went to Japan, um, like growing up at Macallan. You know, it's a mile away from Kregelia. I would go to Elgin, 12, 15 miles away. You'd maybe get your hair cut. Well, I remember those days. Um, and people would say, where are you from? And you'd say, McAllen. They're like, where? And you're like, Kregelke? No, nah, whatever. First time I went to Japan, I was sat in a bar. And uh, this guy was, was oh, I've just come back from Scotland. And he brought out his photo album. Because back in those days, you didn't carry all your phones and your, all your photos in your phone. And he was flicking through it. And I was like, there's a picture of my house. <laughs> so, so, you know, a guy in Japan knew exactly where my house was, but yet someone 12 miles away is like, got no clue. It's, uh, <laughs> I know. it's mental. It is just that interest of, 
and they do love their pictures of the distilleries. And you now it's a great country, and they are the bars are phenomenal. I always thought a, a Japanese whiskey bar would be great in Edinburgh. And if anybody's ever thinking about opening it, that's my idea. <laughs> well, thinking of doing that, that's my retirement plan. I just turned you on, turned you the wrong way. Around, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> it's a whole different story. <laughs> oh dear. Um, let's see. So. Uh, I got completely dragged uh, or lost in in your in your in your life whiskey life there. So, oh, yeah. so, so I was at I'm at Duncan Taylor at this point, and then I spent eight years with them. So not the, yeah. not the two and a half. No. And then um, I left there with nothing to go to, and got a job with Cabinets, which was great. So really good for Kate that she'd moved up to Speyside to be nearer me, having left. Uh, Having left Campbelltown, and I get a job in Campbelltown. So. <laughs> Very good planning. <laughs> so she, you just packed up and moved to Campbelltown together? Yeah, well, we, I got to work from home for the first couple of years um, because Kate was at Glen Fartless. Um, okay, yes. When she fell pregnant with uh, Zach, we were like, right, we're moving to Campbelltown because yes. it's such a great place to bring up kids. Mm -hmm. And I worked there uh, anyway. So, uh, so yeah. And, and you had her parents there for, for childcare. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I remember those days when you could use parents for childcare. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now like in hazmat suits. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was good. I came down here, had a great time in Canheads. Um, still and, the world or whatever. And so that is uh, amazing. And so now you and Kate have finally decided to start your own. So you've got what whiskey? And yes. it, it says an independent bottler whiskey company? Yes, allegedly. Well, it will be. Um, <laughs> so we, again, I had, I had no job. Um, and I was like, right, we want we want to stay in Campbelltown. Yeah. Uh, you know, Kate was pregnant. Um, want to stay in Campbelltown. Want to stay in the whiskey industry. Um, I did manage to get a, a few job offers. Uh, thanks to everybody that did that. But most of them were not staying in Campbelltown um, or traveling, you know, traveling a lot. And to be honest, I've done plenty yeah. of traveling over the years. I uh, was kind of getting used to having other people to do that for you. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was fair enough. And so Kate and I, we were having, we went to uh, Tom Kitchen in Edinburgh. Uh, we'd, we went there for a meal and we're like, no, this is great. We've um, no, no job uh, and pregnant and going out for a very expensive meal. A mission and instead of a restaurant. Yeah. Um, so that's when we were like started plotting and discovered that ah, we can probably do this. Uh, so let's set up on our own. Um, we started the company, the Campbelltown uh, Company Whiskey Company Limited. Okay. Um, although although that's a company name, we'll be using what whiskey on the brand name mm -hmm. because due to um, I mean Campbell Whiskey Company Limited was too good a name not to have when we discovered it was there. And we'll use that as the kind of parent company name and for doing the tastings and things yeah. like that. Yeah, makes sense. Um, but because of uh, the 2009 regulations, um, you can't use the name of a region on a label if the whiskey's not from that region. Oh, of course, yes. So, you know, even if it's your company name or your website name, you can't use it. No. Um, so that's why we're using what whiskey. Um, Initially, I didn't want to use our name. It's a bit, you know, big heated. Um, no, it sounds great. I think it's the alliteration is quite good, and and yeah. our design and and uh, our design company, our marketing company that we're using for yeah. all our labels and that they, they kind of talked us into it, which is which is good. So now register of whatwhiskey dot com and all these kind of things, and we're getting there. With labels are coming along. Um, we need to do a website to be honest um we've we've bought our first casks we've got that's exciting six, six, seven casks um, how many seven casks we've got now um, nice and buying another two this week um so it's 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 getting there but obviously oh. we've got bottling um you know we've got access to bottling halls etc so all that's in motion um we just need to 
finalized designs and everything. I have to stop you right there because I am going to continue. But you know what? We have actually run out of time. They only let you have one hour on Instagram, which I usually manage. I'll So we ran out of time. That was, um, I should have thought about that terrible interview technique from me. I should have really been a bit more on the ball, but I just love hearing about all these stories that Mark has. And also his, it's not like he's only worked in the industry for five minutes. He has been in industry for a long time and he knows so much. Let me see what whiskey. I'm so, oh, hey, Julie. Julie's joining us now as well. Great. It might be that it's eight o'clock is a better time for this. But anyway, here we go. Part, this is the first time I'm doing a second part. <laughs> yeah, the, the second, the, the, the sequel is normally the worst one of the films. <laughs> I, I, really, I know, but I'm loving this. It's such great uh, information. Oh, partly makes up for all those times at school. People, I know, ask you what your last name was. I was thinking that actually when you were talking about what whiskey. My first job uh in, in 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 scotland was in travel and i remember sitting at um, a book student travel for edinburgh university students at at uh, use of campus travel if anybody ever booked travel there in the 90s it was probably me and this this boy or, or student came in and, and i says oh what's your name and he says that's my name and i didn't get it being a swedish 19 year old going what is he talking about yeah what's my name what is my name <laughs> so what is a great name it's got lots of um Funny, I don't know. I got I got detention for doing that. In my well, then I managed to get out of it. But uh, when I went to high school, uh, the the headmaster was like, uh, "Who are you?" And I was like, "Mark." And he went, "Mark what?" And I went, "Yes." And he thought I was being cheeky. I was like, <laughs> "I just thought." <laughs> I was like, "This, this guy's good. He knows my end name." <laughs> <laughs> well, it's bound to happen, isn't it? <laughs> oh, Although, no. a lot of people have been pointing out that it should really be which whiskey. But um, it's the grammar police, you know. I know. <laughs> Which whiskey? Say what? <laughs> so listen, you, 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 are you doing all the design, the website? Are you doing that all yourself or are you just sort of getting people uh, in to help you? We've got people in. Uh, we've got um, good friends of ours. Um, Nick, he owns Easy, Easy Tiger Creative in London. Wait, I'm um, going to say Easy Jet there for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> That's another nickel. In fairness, I, I will be using EasyJet for all my flights these days. So, <laughs> bing bing. You know, um, so my, our, our export policy is only where EasyJet or Ryanair fly to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I can't afford the business class flights anymore. It's, oh, no. it's, it's quite funny how your, uh, your company expenses change when it's your own money that you're yep. spending. Um, yeah. I know what you as, mean. There's yeah. a few people who met me in the in the art shield the other day, uh, well, the other day <laughs> before this in January, <laughs> when yeah. I bought when I bought like a couple of pints for, instead of shouting the bar. But it was, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. I know, uh, but no, but great. So yeah, so it, it is uh, the plan is to be uh, as what whiskey an independent bottler. Yeah. So we'll do what whiskey. We've got what rum as well. Okay. Um, so we'll start with whiskey, predominantly whiskey, obviously, we'll, we're mm -hmm. going to do rum and then eventually move into whatever, you know, yeah. as, long as, as long as it's good, um, needs to be good, usual stuff, non-chill filter, natural colour, no added sugar, you know, all the good stuff. Um, exactly. And then, you know, take it from there. The, the idea is not to be huge, not to take over the world. No. Um, just, you know, small amounts, probably start in four or five countries. Um, you know, we're looking at probably Belgium, Denmark, Taiwan, and Japan to kick off with, and the UK. Um, and well, then, this is the thing: if you're doing single casks and, and yeah. you're focusing on flavour, you're not spoiled for choice, so you might have a few hundred bottles to, yeah. to sell. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at probably trying to do between twelve, fifteen, maybe a bit more casks per year. Nothing, mm -hmm. you know, nothing huge. So we can be fairly, fairly selective when things. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of being your own boss. You decide. Like, if you want to do, uh, have a big year, you decide to do that and you budget for that. But I think yeah, you're right. As, as, long as, as, as long as we have enough money to pay the wages and yeah. pay the mortgage. Uh, pay your mortgage, exactly. You know, that would be, and, and to be honest, this, this COVID thing, it was obviously not good, but it, it's not been too bad for us because we hadn't planned to sell anything this year anyway. No. So, 
Well, well that's it. Everybody's in the yet. Yeah. Because uh, we didn't have any. Um, no. So, we, I mean, we have lost out because we didn't have, we were planning tastings throughout the summer, you know, and, and various events and things. But yeah. But we'll, we'll missed out on that. But, we're, but not just yeah. you. It's the same for everybody in the industry. Yeah. So in a way, it gives you an even uh, plateau to start off your um, when you start next year or whatever it will be. Yeah. So we're, we're hoping maybe September, late this year, we'll get something bottled. Um, Great. It's 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 getting there. Um, yeah. But it's it, it's it's funny. Like it is all very exciting. Um, but it's not going to be until you've got that bottle in your hand with our label on it, because. You know, I've bought and sold casks for years. Yeah. Um, and it says very exciting, you know, but it's it's not nothing new. No, I mean, it's new because it's our money. Um, it's but, what you do. It's what you've been yeah. doing for so, so long. I think it's 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 going to be like the amazing thing is going to be one, once we get something bottled or you know when I walk into the Ard Shield and can order my own whiskey. Um, yeah. That's that's going to be pretty phenomenal, to be honest. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, I can't wait. I think that's going to be so exciting. Sure. So, what would be your dream? Say your dream cask, where would that come from? Just if you had, like, just there's no limits. You could just get one dream cask. Where and who there's, would it be from? What there's, era? There's, there's, there's too, too many to, to choose, oh. really. Um, but probably a November 1972 Capodonic would be oh. the... Um, would would be one of the one of the holy grails if that makes sense. Okay. Um, well, but I mean, I'd love. The the great thing is everything that we bottle will be the first time we've bottled it. So mm -hmm. okay, I'm not going to bottle this Glen Elgin because it's already sold. But when mm -hmm. we bottle a Glen Elgin, it'll be the first Glen Elgin we've ever done. Uh -huh. And yeah. when we bottle a, a whatever, you know, yeah. it'll be the first. Yeah. You know, it'll be the first Tully yeah. Bard even or whatever. Um, yeah. So everything's going to be going to be exciting. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, obviously, I'd love to bottle some Macallan. Uh, I'd love to bottle Mortlux, everything. Of course, yeah, no. Um, but it's you know, being being brutally honest, we're not going to have the access to the big sexy names um, because they're just too expensive. Yeah. Yeah. That looking at it, casks are out there. You know, in the last three months, I've been offered just shy of a thousand casks. I was going to say that somebody else is talking about starting their own and they're finding it. Oh, I just missed that question. That's terrible. But somebody was saying that they're, do ask me again, Jer, Whiskey Jer. Um, I didn't see that question because um, the Connell is waving as well. I'm, I'm yeah, he's, he's, on, he's, saying, he's saying, oh, no, I'm just being daft. I am being daft. How is finding good casks given so many new bottlers? Well, that's a good question because I, like I said, I do know quite a few people are starting off. Um, yeah. um, is there a big competition then? There is. I mean, there's there's big competition for, like, the big names, and and it's quite good actually because the prices are just so crazy that you're not even going to look mm. at them. No. Um, you know, and that's quite good. I quite. It sounds terrible that I'm quite pleased that things are crazy priced because I'm not. I'd rather I could afford them. Yeah. But it's, they're so out of the out of the range that you're not even looking at them, so you don't have to go. Oh, I'll stretch myself to do this or whatever. But there's there's plenty of casks. The problem is having good access to them um, yeah. and getting them from the right people at the right price because there's a huge, huge transparency, a, a huge difference in pricing. Um, okay. I'll not mention any names, but there was some whiskey, a 10-year-old whiskey from the same distillery. I got offered cask of the same thing from three different people. And one of the prices was five times the price of some of the oh. others. So is that the brokers then that can play a little bit of a game with you well, if they like? The thing is, there's brokers and there's brokers. Um, there's some brokers that are buying a lot. There's other brokers that are buying from other brokers. And, you know, so it depends. Well, so that adds their margins, yeah. of course. And it yeah. depends who, who gets the gets the casks first, you know. it's. Uh, I'm new to this whole, like, is it a bit, like, you, you don't have to answer this question because this is just me, but is there a bit of a, like, Wild West going on with that whole brokering now at the moment? Is it, Or is it just that, there are so many levels to it now. Um, there is, there's, there are some Wild West people out there. Mm. Um, again, I've mentioned no names. No. Uh, a lot of you on here will know exactly <laughs> who who we're speaking to. It, um, <laughs> and then there, there, there are others that um, that are much more reputable. 
Um, one of the biggest problems is getting samples. Um, so oh, I'm giving you kisses now. That's my son saying good night. <laughs> yeah, I, it's okay. I saw that. I, I'm just assuming you're just giving me random kisses, but <laughs> yeah. Oh. But we're lucky. We, we've got we've got uh, good relations with quite a few brokers, and some of them will give us uh, samples. And so yeah. at, the, at the minute, I'm only buying on samples because we can't wow. take the punt. Um, but down the line, you probably will. There's some brokers in the past I would trust with my life. So you'd be like, if they recommend it, you know, you're all right. Well, I suppose you build up that rapport and, and, and the trust, like you're saying, with various brokers or people that are investing in whiskey and selling on, that you have uh, you have the trust, you know, the quality there. But quite a lot of offers are now non-samples that you just get, um, uh, you, you get them without samples or like what Eddie's asking, you pay for samples. And yeah, you do, you do. I, have I don't remember a time where you didn't have and, to pay and, for samples. In fairness, I've not paid for any yet. I've no. not paid, but um, I will have to. I will have to. I've been, I've been very fortunate um, that people have. I've, I've been lucky. I've managed to pull in a few favours from people, and, and people have been very helpful, um, which which has been nice. Um, mm. But you will pay samples. You'll pay fifty quid for a sample. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which you know, which is well, fine. if you think if about it, I mean. But mm -hmm. if you if you if you have to buy ten samples to buy one cask, you know that's that's a lot of money. It adds yeah. Up. yeah, and then you add that to the the price, and then you have to explain why you're buying. Now, I've, having worked with Brent Foreman or or, or Glen Glen Jonic, who who released a lot of Van a lot of single casks. Yeah. I I looked after their um uh their single cask scheme for a while, and uh, it's not an easy job getting samples. They they. they that there was a lot of work that goes into that. You just don't, yeah. when we know, because we've worked at distilleries, we can see the ladders going up and they have to run up, pull the, like, pull the bong out and get the samples. It's not an easy job. So of course, uh, somebody should pay for that, I suppose. Yeah. And, they've, they've and, and the thing is, if, if, if a distillery, I shouldn't be defending this, but if a distillery staff member is getting your sample, they're not doing the work that we're supposed to be doing. That's uh, it. Yeah. You know, so and, and there's all the paperwork and stuff that yeah. goes on as well. So exactly. it is understandable. It's annoying, but it's it's Yeah, I know, I know. But then yeah, exactly. But I, then I, it, if we if we have samples and we want to sell some of our casks on other people, I'll be charging them the for samples. Yeah. So. yeah. This is it. Um uh, oh, so what if now you've only, you've bought seven casks so far? But say you and Kate are having a meeting and you're trying samples, and she says, "Love this one. This is a great whiskey." And you think, "What she's off her head? That's awful. What? No, no way am I putting my name on that whiskey." Have you decided who's going to get the final say? Well, Kate, Kate has said that I will always get the final say when it comes to that, but we've not Never. had any disagreements yet. Um, so I would imagine, uh, I imagine Kate will get her way. Uh, <laughs> no, I, Kate, Kate, Kate's got a phenomenal palate actually. Um, and she's, she kind of possibly puts herself down a wee bit. She, she's more knowledgeable about whiskey than, than she lets on, I think. Yeah. Um, and so she is, she is good. Um, we, we had a couple of discussions the other night where we tried some samples and, you know, the thing is, you've got to look at what will sell as yeah. well. What sell at that price? But it's, it's not. There was one sample. Kate was like, oh, it's not really her style, mm -hmm. but it's going to sell, or you know, and it's it's good, you know. And, yeah, and that's, actually, we have a question here that sort of relates to. That. So, who will be your target group, and what's your initiative? Is it the drinkers, the collectors, or the investors? So this this all plays in, obviously, while you're choosing. Um. Yeah, it's drinkers. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think Always. anyone. I don't think. I don't think anyone will ever collect our whiskey, to be honest. Um, but yeah, you never know. And it's maybe if I get run over by a bus or something, it'll go up in value. But it, it's, um, it's, it's there. It's we want people to drink it. Um, yeah. We'll we'll try and be as well priced as we can. But obviously, we have to pay for everything. We'll have to pass that on. But yeah. We want, we want people to drink it. Um, and then move on to the next one, move on to the next one. Um, it's, and that's why we've already um, taken, we've already turned down a few casks of things that would have, would have been good. Yeah. It would just, 
wouldn't sit right in the price points or you know i mean i got offered i got offered a cast for 1.2 million quid i was like who do you think i am you know <laughs> Oh, I don't even want to know what that was. That my children on the moon or something? What's going yes, on there? Yes. <laughs> you know, but it's it's there is a, a big variety of things, and oh, so yeah. Dear. But there, there's there are some good deals to be had on on some younger stuff. You know, at the minute we're not able to buy to lay down. You know, we're oh quite, really? We're, we're quite well. You know, I need to buy and sell. Yeah. Fairly quickly within twelve months, eighteen months mm -hmm. or so. Um, you know, looking at the future, we then might be able to go and buy some younger spirit and sit on it for four or five years but you know we've got to work within our means um because i thought and my understanding was that there was quite a few offers on from various distilleries about that that they would offer you by spirit yeah, you, you can't you can't buy well there's lots of new make spirit being offered to people at ridiculous prices mm, um, okay. which just makes it not feasible uh, no. and you there are there's a lot of young whiskey on the on the go at the minute that you could do but you know i'm we're not at the stage yet of being able to buy a five-year-old whiskey and sit on it for five years no. and then bottles of ten but you never know what might happen i'm hoping that happens um but hey, yeah you just don't we'll know yeah, well, that was a question that was sent in uh, in advance from the Distilled magazine. They asked, does, does um, age matter? Uh, and I assume they mean uh, in general of whiskey, obviously drinking it, but they could relate to you, your business uh, as well. Does it matter in your mind? Yeah, I mean, age doesn't matter as long as it's good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's the main thing, you know. Of bottle, you know, we'll, we don't, we're not constricted by years. You know, it has to be a 12 year old, has to be an 18, has to be a thing. If we get a seven year old that's fantastic, we'll bottle it. Yeah. Uh, if it's good value for money uh, and if it's good quality. Yeah. Um, if we get, if we have something that's, you know, nine years old, we'll not necessarily wait till it's 10, just, you know, bottle well, it if it, when it's good. Um, so that, that's a good thing. There are absolutely no restrictions on what we do other than legal restrictions, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but what? we've got we've got ultimate freedom, so. Brilliant. I mean, that's the beauty. You and Kate have well, well, the ultimate freedom to bottle what you like and to sell to who you want. And, yes. Um, yeah, that's done. Yeah, so basically we're going to be that's selling done. countries, countries that we like going to. Yeah. <laughs> yes. pe 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 nice people. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, it is all about people. The, the yeah. whiskey industry is a global industry. It's huge, but right. it's small. We all know each other. And it's all about relationships. You know, exactly. everything's about relationships. And that yeah. is, um, that's very important. It is. You're absolutely right. I mean, I have so many more questions for you. Um, any other passions than whiskey? Is there anything in their life that isn't whiskey? Rum. Apart from your family, of course. Rum, mezcal. Uh, <laughs> Gym. You don't play golf or bowl or any, you're not marathon yeah, running? I, or I, I do very little of anything. Um, annoyingly, the one thing I have started missing since uh, lockdown is the gym, which I never thought I would ever say. Um, <laughs> but, but I had started going to the gym about three times a week and going like swimming a couple of, couple of miles a week. Um, yeah. And I was just getting good at that and then lockdown. So it's well, kind of, as you can see, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's it's uh, all taking its toll, but um, I, I like being outside. I, I actually quite into my, my nature, my bird watching, all that kind of stuff. Oh, but, nice. uh, so it's quite good to uh, taking the boy out and looking at these yeah. guys. Yeah. And now with the lockdown, there's no airplanes in the air. So in Edinburgh, we've noticed in our garden we have so many more birds than we've seen before. And my boy is six. He's the same. He's loving watching the birds with his little binoculars. Yeah. It's uh, me and Zach. We've been sleeping out in the tent in the garden quite often, and you know, the, the, the birds are so loud in the morning these days. It's uh, yeah, but uh, it's nice though. It's great. Like that's a great hobby to have, and to pass on and to share but, with the kids. And like even being down here, you know, you've got the stuff in your garden, and you just walk down. And you've got the seabirds. You know, you've got mm -hmm. the gannets diving. If from this office, if the big boat's not in, I can see the sea, and I can. Watch the gannets diving. So it's, uh... it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I loved living there. I lived in Macrahanish and on in the farm on the corner, and it was just the beach with just there, the golf course. I just loved it. 
we're, we're going back. We'll be back um, as soon as we can. We'll see what happens with lockdown. We, we're, we've got flights booked for Sweden this summer, but if the lockdown is stopping us from traveling ab abroad, we might stay in Scotland and come yeah. over. Um, being from the north, you are quite, uh, you, you know a bit of Doric, don't you? That's some... Yeah. I, I, I always mean, because see when we are away in pubs around the world and there'll be somebody else that has a Doric word and you can have a wee banter and I always think it's so funny. What's your favourite word? What's your favourite Scottish Doric? Do you know, I was thinking about this the other day and it would probably be fuckrit. Pardon? Fuckrit. <laughs> fuckrit. Yeah. Fuckrit. Which is a ferret. A ferret? So a you're scared, ferret. you're a ferret of something, you're scared? No, a, no, a ferret. A ferret? Oh, the animal, a ferret. Yeah. Oh. So it always goes back to, it was, when I was young, there was a, a, a comedy group, uh, well, three guys, called Scotland of What? And uh, they used to do this routine about uh, a, a ferret, and you're like, spell it. Uh, so it's F-E-R-R-E-T. Futterit. <laughs> Futterit. Yeah. Oh, or, my. Or, or, or other things like that. It would be like, uh, D... U C K, Duke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I love all those kind of things. And to be honest, my 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 Tuchterness, my Dorikness is dies down quite a lot. But like, if I get on the phone to some people or meet other Doric speakers, and more drums come, it uh, it comes out quite a lot. I have heard you in, in full swing. I love it. I think it's great. Um... I, I mean, just those like that fit like and, you yeah. know. Well, that's, that's, that's one thing, like, I always say, like, uh, the other one is, you know, loons and quines. So boys and girls are loons and quines. Oh. And I always remember, like, when I first kind of came down here, well, when I first came down to Campbelltown, Kate's mum and dad needed subtitles for me. It was, <laughs> it was quite bad. It's but a also, hard like, when, when I was working at Caddenheads, like, I would, you know, quite often refer to, uh, like, Cameron, be like, oh, how fit like loon? I said, how are you? And yeah. like he thought I was calling him a loony, uh, you know, and I'm like, no, it's it's a, a colloquial term up north. It's actually, you know. So I think a few people thought I was like calling Cameron a loony when actually it's oh. just, you know, fit like loon. It's, uh, but oh. it's one of those things, fit like, you answer it with fit like, you know. It's, it's like, yeah. yeah. It's like, fit like, I feel like. You, you never really answer it. <laughs> Great. I mean, it's, it's, um, I love Scotland. It's full of uh, surprises. And that's kind of a, a yeah, I, I love it when I hear uh, Doric being spoken with Reen, like yourself. And I'm trying to remember who it was because um, somebody else that's an um, brand ambassador. We were in Belgium or somewhere. Yeah. And away, once, and... it get, once it gets going, there's no stopness. I know. Oh, Mark, I've had the best of times. I... Sorry for blethering for so long. Not uh, at all. We should do it again. Once you've should... got your premier bottling, we should yeah, do it. Yeah, some new bottlings. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll never be off of this thing. It's, uh... I know. I'll well, this not... is it. Like, I think the digital marketing side of things, I, I, people are probably going to change the way they do their sales. I, it works. I mean, you can you can meet and speak to so many people through through your gadgets these days. So Yeah, and I think it's, it's well, and that cuts down my travel expenses, which is nice. Well, that's it. Um, but it, it will be. And I think if you can do it right, so I'm just making this up, but say people can host a, an event, say, in Japan or wherever, Belgium, wherever, and everyone congregates together there, and then you do this to them, rather yeah. than necessarily everyone being, like for a tasting, this is fine, but for a tasting, mm -hmm. nope. people can get together, because um, obviously the best way to sell alcohol is to give people alcohol, um, you know, <laughs> and it's, you know. It's so easy, uh, try my whiskey, hopefully try my whiskey. That. So I, can, I can see hopefully we'll get a, an iPad set up in the Mashtan in Tokyo, and I'll sit and drink here, and people can drink there, or whatever. Oh. That would be so good. Amazing. Get, get the tie around the head again. So it's... <laughs> my, um, I'm looking at my cheat notes here. I have probably asked you everything that was written down, but my, I, my head is just buzzing with more questions for you that, as we were chatting. I um, Thank you so much to everybody that's been listening in. And I, I hope I've covered most questions. Um, I will put this video on my Instagram TV, but also uh, YouTube it later on this week. Um, sure, once we'll, give it, we'll give it a share later on once you do that. Great. Absolutely brilliant. Mark Watt of What Whiskey Campbelltown. Thank you so much. And thank you, Kate, for letting us have Mark uh, in the middle of bedtime. So you've got Zach and Joe. 
Um, hopefully they've been behaving themselves. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully they're all bedded by the time I get home. <laughs> Are you going home for your dinner? Oh, I've had my tea. I've had my tea. <laughs> I eat the kids' dinner after. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mark. And we need a pint when this is all over. Yes, and I want to. I, see... I, I, that's what I'm really even a, even a rubbish pint. I'm just yes. looking forward to. A pint. Yeah, absolutely, a pint yeah. somewhere in person. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Take care, right? Thank Cheers. you, everybody. Bye. Bye now.